Next one, can a, can a true believer live in sin to the very end of their life and still go to heaven? No. No. That it's very clearly laid out in the Bible. Why? Because God stops true believers from living a life of sin because he's put his name on them. And he says, you're not going to be acting. When you're born into my family, you cannot act any longer like you're of your father, the devil. And if you want to and choose to, I'm going to interfere with your life to whatever level I have to interfere to make you stop. So the quick answer, these are all the quick answers. I just wanted to give you the quick answers. Uh, no, a true believer cannot live in sin to the very end of their life and still go to heaven because if they live in sin to the very end of their life and God doesn't intervene, they weren't a true believer. Now you notice this is several parts for A and B and C because it's so big. Because what we really need to talk about really is this. Can a true believer, true believer, live in sin to the very end of their life? First, let's look at who God says doesn't go to heaven. This is what prompted this. This actually started, uh, the, the switchboards lit up after um, the first message on salvation. Let's go to Revelation 21, 8. This was, uh, we were right in the middle of the um, throne room of the universe series, and I just had everybody flip to the end, and I says, well, let's just look at, at everybody that's going to be in heaven. And I very lightly read this list. And look, look at Revelation 21.8. And by the way, these, all these verses that I'm telling you about, if you're ever going to talk to people, minister to people, do personal work, do any biblical counseling or discipleship, these are some of the key verses in the whole Bible that, that you should have somehow noted and starred or something. But this is what it says. Um, and, and 21 is the new heaven, new earth, and we're, we're in the eternal state. And he starts in verse 7, he who overcomes, and don't, don't define overcoming by what you think it means. That is a biblically defined term. And it says in 1 John that an overcomer is equal to a born-again believer. There is not, there aren't super Christians and normal ones and then bad ones. All Christians the Bible says anybody that's saved, anybody that's going to heaven is an overcomer. They have overcome sin and death and hell and destruction and the grave and the power of sin. It's part of salvation. It's kind of like trying to pull out, you know, some part of your, strip out some of your DNA out of every cell. You can't do that. It's, it's part of the DNA of a believer that they're an overcomer. But, but he who overcomes, that's a born-again Christian, you don't have to define it in Revelation 21. It's been defined all the way through 1 John and the beginning of Revelation. So there's no new meaning here. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. So believers inherit all things. And I will be as God. Believers find the fulfillment of the Lord says, Emmanuel, God with us, and, and, and you will dwell in my house. I mean, it's just, this is just reiterating everything that believers have already been told. And I will be as God, and he shall be my son. Uh, but as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God. So see, this is just all what we already know. But, now look at verse 8. Look at this list of who doesn't go to heaven. Is that on your radar? Cowardly? Cowardly? First? These are the fearful people that are in Re uh, Romans 1. God says, I haven't given you a spirit of fear. I, I, we need to work on that because a lot of people live in dread fear and God doesn't like fear. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral. Now I mentioned this morning, did you know there's a danger? For, for decades, Youth speakers have told young people, you're going to struggle in college. Everybody does. When you get to be about 30, you'll come back to the Lord and make him Lord of your life. Did you know those words, make him Lord, are not in the Bible. You cannot make Jesus Lord of your life. 
He already is if you're a Christian. And if he's not the Lord of your life, you're not a Christian. The Bible, like overcomer, he's already defined that in the Bible. But it says the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, that's an interesting word, pharmakeia, has to do with drugs. Drugs are not new. They're very old. Uh, there has always been drug use tied with the occult and tied with opening the mind and, and uh, you know, being in this, this mentally affected, trance-like, hallucinatory type of behavior. In fact, if you ever heard of the Oracle of Delphi and, and the, uh, all of those, they, they were involved in, in fact, there used to be the, the, uh, a volcanic chasm that had vapors coming out of it, and they used to, in the Greek gods, they would put these priestesses over that vent and allow them to, to breathe in these poisonous gases, kind of like putting gas in your car and stand there, you know, and just sniffing that as long as you can until it starts affecting your mind. And then they would go into a trance and start giving prophecies. The Lord says, watch out for sorcery. Any drug-induced effects on your mind, and that opens your mind to the occult. Be careful of that. Idolaters, what is an idolater? Anybody that puts some created thing, an object or, or a desire, on the same shelf as God, that's idolatry, materialism, covetousness. And all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So I just read that, and the switchboard lit up, and people said, are you telling me that, you know, my friend is not going to heaven? I said, no, I didn't say that. Who wrote this? God said that. God says those people, the, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, will not be in heaven, but they are forever going to burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So who does God say won't go to heaven? That list. Now, real quickly, let's go to Ephesians 5, and... Uh, and I'm backing up through the Bible here. Let, let's, I'll just show you all the lists because, well, no, I won't show you all of them. It'd take too long. I'm going to show you a few of them because there are about 19 of these lists, sinless, in the New Testament, and I'm only going to show you a handful. Uh, Therefore, be imitators of God, Ephesians 5. One is dear children, and walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself as an offering, a sacrifice to God, a sweet smell, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish toss, talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And what I just said should absolutely change the lives of a lot of people if you really believe the Word of God. God says you shouldn't even have a hint of all that stuff. You're a saint. And, and don't say I'm just joking because God doesn't joke and he doesn't like that kind of coarse, filthy, foolish talking, jesting, that's not fitting. If you don't know what to do, say you're thankful. Give thanks. You know, that's what he said. But now look, here's the punch. Ephesians 5.5. 5, For this you know, that no fornicator, no one whose life is consistently and persistently characterized by fornication. And fornication is any sexual activity outside of marriage. Mental, physical, uh, consensual, sporadic, just you can put any, you know, uh, modifier on it, fornication, any sexual activity outside of marriage. No fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Oh, oh, inheritance. So do you know what? There's a movement now that says, oh, there are two kind, two, heaven has two sections. First class and coach. And in the coach are the fornicators I mean, they just can't stop, and the covetous, they live their whole life for money, their job, their house, their clothes, 
you know what I mean? And the first class, those people that were so busy for God, you know, they're in the first class section, but we're going, but we're in the coach. You say, that's not funny. It's not, but there's a whole group that believes that. And what they, they, they say that the inheritance is up here. These are the ones that inherit the kingdom of God. They are in first class. They're up there getting juice and steak, and we're getting peanuts and coach if you're, you know, if you're on Southwest. I don't even know if they give food away in the other ones, but you know what I mean? The coach people are back there packed in like sardines, all those fornicators and covetous people and idolaters, and those people that were really into the Bible, they're up there in first class with the white tablecloth eating a steak. That's, that's not what this is saying. Let no one deceive you, verse 6, with empty words, and that's very empty. With empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes in the sons of disobedience. Therefore, don't be partakers with them. Okay, let's look at another one. Look at Galatians 5. It says the same thing. Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. This I say, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, verse 17, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, and so that you don't do the things that you we wish. For if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the tone changes. Now the works, verse 19, of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. Isn't it interesting? Every one of these lists, fornication is either first or second. Always. Sexual sin. And we live in the most over-sexually stimulated culture in history. And it's getting worse. And so this is very relevant. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Adultery, uh, out, married outside of marriage doing something. Fornication, involved in something without the, the covenant of marriage. Uncleanness is thinking and talking and loving and s- just, being, just being soaked in it. And there are those. I mean, they don't do it. They just love it, and they're around it, and they think about it, you know. Lewdness, idolatry. There's that pharmacia word again, sorcery, the whole occult thing. Hatred, contentions. Did you know a contentious person, someone that you say something, they say something else. They're always one-upping you, and they're never going to, they're very opinionated, and you're not going to let anybody, that is a sin. And it's, it's a mark of the flesh, contentions, jealousies. Wow. Outbursts of wrath. Oh, I lost my temper. No, you didn't. You never let go of it. You keep it. Selfish ambitions. That's the American dream. I'm going to get as much as I can. I'm going to climb over as many people as I have to. And if I can snooker you in a deal and make an extra 10000 I'm going to laugh all the way to the bank because you're so dumb and you didn't know how much that was worth, and I did. And I'm going to make money. You know, I just bought something. I laughed about it. I paid. I told Bonnie about this. I paid with real money. And the poor lady at the counter, she, she, she counted it out, and she moved it all around. She put it. She couldn't count is the problem. And finally, she just, she counted it so many times. She just put it all in a, in a, together, and she said, and she said an amount of money. And I looked at her in incredulity. I said, I said what did you say? She said, isn't that how much you gave me? She was, was going to give me change back, a lot of change. I said, no, 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 no. I gave you exactly the amount of the bill. And she just, and she couldn't believe that I wouldn't take, I mean, I, I would have made about 60 bucks on the deal. And, and did you know the Lord says that that is dishonest gain? People, people brag about how they, they got this and the person didn't even know how much it was worth. Amazing. That's a part of our selfishly ambition, anything for myself, society. Dissensions, heresies. Those are people that elevate one thing above. You know, a heretic is someone that takes a a point of doctrine and elevates it too high, uh, kind of like those universalists did. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that those who practice, there's the key, practice such things, are going to be in coach. Oh, there comes that interpretation again. Because we don't want to tell people that grace the aisles of the church, that, that their persistence in sin is making them look like they're unsaved. And so we have to comfortably, it's almost like Roman Catholics made purgatory, 
evangelicals have made the coach section. And those, you know, goody two-shoes people, they're always reading their Bibles and memorizing, having their devotions, and, you know, I mean, they're those kind, they just are all in God stuff all the time. But we're normal, and we're rebelrous and envious and jealous and fornicatious, but we're going to be in the coach section. God says, no, you're not even on the bus. You're not on the plane. Notice what it says. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It says in the Bible that when we're born again, we become co-heirs with Christ. That's what it means to be inheriting the kingdom of God. So the people in coach are not joined to Christ. And I could do the same thing for 1 Corinthians 6. You can read it yourself. Romans 1, you can read it for yourself. So can a true believer live in sin the very end of his life? First of all, who's a true believer? These people aren't. Second, in the church, and, and we'll probably only be able to do this, let's look at one of the most famous verses, 2 Corinthians 13.5. 2 Corinthians 13.5. You ever heard this verse, examine yourself whether you're in the faith? Isn't that a beautiful verse? 2 Corinthians 13.5. This is an amazing verse. Why would Paul write that verse? Well, remember I told you this morning about how you don't understand John 9, 1 through 7, if you don't read John 8, 59. They were picking stones up to cast him at Jesus, and he slipped away. And as he's slipping away, he's cutting through the pools of Bethesda, and he sees a, a man that's been there that is, that is blind. And Jesus stops, and they're chasing him with stones, and that was remarkable. Do you know what the context of this is? Look what this says in verse 5. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith, whether you're in the first class, the people going to heaven. You should check your ticket. You should see if you're saved. Don't let anybody tell you you are. You should examine yourself. In fact, that word examine is a very interesting word. It's kind of like you ever watch a Western, you know, where, where they pay in gold and the guy takes the coin and he says, thanks, and he goes, what? What's he doing? It's that same word. He's examining the coin to see if it's soft as gold is and if his teeth sink into the metal. Teeth don't sink into very many metals. And if you can bite that coin, you have a good idea that it's really gold. And what he says is, bite into your faith to see if you're really saved. And then he says, test yourselves. You know, do, remember the banks had to go through the stress test? Believers are supposed to go through this little test. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? It, it's very interesting. What's the context of that verse to examine yourself whether you're really saved? We'll back up to 2 Corinthians 12, verse 20. If we took out all these chapter divisions, people would understand a lot more about the Bible because we read segmentally, you know, unconnectedly. Look what it says in verse 20. For I fear, I mean, it's just an inch above. For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you as I wish, that you shall be found such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath and selfish ambitions and backbiting and whisperings and conceits and tumults, lest when I come, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lewdness. The Corinthian church was doing all those things. You know what Paul said? Just because you're in this house church that I started, and by the way, there's not a house in Corinth. They've excavated the whole place. There's not a house in Corinth that could hold more than 100 people. So think, Paul spent 18 months pastoring a church that's the size of 90 plus percent of all churches in America. They're all, 90 percent of all churches are under 100, and that's the size church Paul pastored for 18 months. And those people in that church, with all the, the, the wickedness, I mean, if you ever go to the land of the book and go to Corinth, you, you see the gymnasium, which is central because they did the pan Asmanian games in Corinth. So you're standing in the gymnasium, which means a place where you do sports with no clothes on. And as you're standing there, you're looking at the Acro Corinthus, which is the highest sport, spot in the town. It's a mountaintop. And there was the temple to the goddess of lust, 
And between those two is where the leather makers were. There's Paul's, where Paul would disciple people. So he discipled people that walked by the naked gym place, looking up at the prostitute place. I mean, and then if you walk around the streets, I mean, whenever I take tours, you know, it's embarrassing what they carved in the streets. They carved what politely are called phallic symbols. And they had one for everything. You were into homosexuality, you'd follow that one. You're into heterosexuality, you'd follow that one. If you're into bestiality, lesbianism, you just followed the marks and the road. They're still there. They're carved in the pavement. And you know what Paul says? He says, you all, you all need to examine yourself whether you're saved. Paul said that. He didn't say, ah, I saw you raise your hand. Don't worry, you're in. You prayed, good. No. No. He says, bite into it. See if it's real. Because it doesn't look like it's real. If you have outbursts of anger and jealousy and contentions, verse 20, and selfish ambitions and backbitings, and if you have uncleanness and fornication and lewdness in your life, examine yourself if you're in the faith. Now, real quickly, next time. This is fascinating. And this is why I don't want to rush through it. I think most people don't even know the biblical doctrine of chastening. You know what it says in Hebrews 12? Fascinating passage. If you have an old King James, there's a swear word in there. You know what it says? It says if you say you're a Christian and you're living in sin like in any of those lists and nothing is happening, then God isn't your father. You are illegitimate. And it uses a swear word. You know what that means? God says that God will chasten everybody who's a believer. If they remain unchastened, they prove they are illegitimate and have never been born again children of God. That answers the question for people that say, well, I have this friend and we were in youth group together in middle school and now, I mean, they've become, a, you know, a, an agnostic, an atheist, and, and a, a lesbian, and, and they're a drug addict, and they're an alcoholic, and they deny God. What you ask is, is the Lord chastening them? If he never does, they're illegitimate. And we'll, we'll study the doctrine of chastening, Lord willing, next time. It's 7.15, we've got to go. We've got to clear the building. So let's all stand because the ceiling falls at, you know, if we go over time. So, so what I'd like to encourage you is, you ought to write some of these down. You ought to, if you don't have a plan for your devotions this, this week, you ought to read Hebrews 12. It's one of the most encouraging passages in the Bible. You know what it ends with in verse 24? Those who are registered in heaven. The only people going to heaven have reservations. They're registered. It's wonderful. Minutes on. Can a true believer live in sin? Every one of these words is important. Live in sin. Doesn't mean sin. Doesn't mean stumble, fall live. That's what the Bible calls a liar. It isn't someone that lies. It's someone that, that, I mean, we've had people in public arena. It's like, do they ever tell the truth? I mean, there's a book written, The Day America, you know, tells the truth, the whole country would stop. It's just, do, not do you at a moment when you're challenged, not fully explain something the way you should, and when you look back, you wish you would have said it better, or in an embarrassing moment, say something that, that isn't true, and you say, Lord, I was wrong, please forgive me. I'm talking about someone that just manipulates and has no regard for truth. They live in sin. But can they do that to the very end of their life and still go to heaven? And the question is answered, no, God stops true believers from a life of sin. So let's, let's look at this. Whoop. First, I have to... Come on, Dan. What am I doing wrong, Dan? Doesn't like me. Maybe the board is sinning. <laughs> Let me try this. There we go. It, it likes the keyboard. Uh, first, and, and I'll cover this again, whom does God say won't go to heaven? You can look at the sin list. And these are only a few. There are about 19 of them in the New Testament. Uh, these are just some major ones. Revelation 20, Ephesians 5, Galatians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, and Romans 1. We talked about that a lot last week. Secondly, in the church, what was the context of 2 Corinthians 13, 5's examine yourself whether you're in the faith or whether you're saved? And the context is in, in chapter 
12, where it says some of you, and he lists off all of the sins of the saints. But what he's saying is, saints can commit those sins, but if they never repent and forsake them, you should examine yourself whether you're saved. So that's, that was what we covered last week. Um, then, uh, last week, we also looked at this, but we're going to begin here. And I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, for the context of chastisement, the biblical doctrine of chastisement is alluded to. It's kind of like shepherd and sheep. John 10 is the mother load of that. Chastisement, the, the most complete treatment is right here in Hebrews 12. But, but the third element is this. Always remember, in the context of can you live to sin to the very end of your life, always remember that if they are a believer, see, this, one of the tests of salvation, uh, you know, uh, there are many ways we can be assured that we're a believer. Um, one is calling on the name of the Lord. You know, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, it's not like there's some secret uh, invo, you know, incantation. It's just calling out to the Lord. That's why a child can be saved. That's why someone who knows very little about the gospel can be saved. Because it is not whether they exactly intone the right sequence of words. It's whether they make connection with the Lord because he's the one that saves. But how, how are you assured that, that you're a believer? Here's one assurance that you're a believer, and it's this. If you're a believer, and if you have sin that is persisting in your life, God will chasten you, or else. Or else what? Or else you're not a believer. You understand, I don't have to prove that I'm a believer. If I'm a believer, God will bear witness with that. I don't have to. It's not like uh, I have to manufacture evidence. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that, that manufactures the evidence. He bears, energizes, prompts, causes, quickens our lives to demonstrate that. But what do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's just read Hebrews um, chapter 12. And um, starting, I mean, I, I, I started in, in verse 3. I love 1 and 2, but so do you. So you already know the context there of, of our whole, you know, looking unto Jesus' race. But look at verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed. This is alluding to, you know, the whole Luke 22, Jesus uh, crying out in the garden and, and sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. You haven't done that, the writer of Hebrews says, striving against sin. You haven't had your blood vessels burst and, and, and sweat blood like Jesus did from the crushing load of of uh, the sin of the world. Verse 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Now here comes the chastening. Um, if, and this is what we're looking at, if, they, if, if a person that claims to be a Christian remains unchastened, not by the church, this is not church chastening. The context here is God chastening. If they remain unchastened, they prove that they are illegitimate. That's the term God uses. And an illegitimate person is a never born again child of God. In other words, they claim to be a child of God. They were never born again. Matthew 7 says, they say, Lord, Lord, but they don't do what he says. Luke chapter uh, 6 says, they claim, but they do not. They don't have the transformed life. So let's read it. Verse 5. You've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and, and look at the end of verse 6, and scourges every son whom he receives. Scourges? Who else was scourged? Christ. Scourging is very negative. Scourging was, I mean, they, a lot of men, a lot of people, not just men, never made it to the cross because the scourging killed them. 
Scourging is a very negative, it's a very, I mean, this is not, you know, I remember when I used to be at Ralia Elementary School, um, uh, Mrs. Ralia, the, the principal of the school, this is elementary, she was only about this high, but she carried a very big ruler. I mean, she always was rapping us on, and, and I'm glad they made all those laws to not beat kids, you know, because it was kids like me that got beaten a lot, you know, in school. But, but I never got scourged. I got hit with a ruler. This is serious. But look what it says. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and the parallelism, this is from Proverbs, and scourges every son whom he receives. Jesus takes us just like we are and loves us, but he won't let us stay like we are. We've been bought at a price. He's given us a new heart, a new spirit. He's, putting his, he's put his spirit within us to cause us to keep his commandments. And if we resist, refuse, and disobey him and begin acting like an unbeliever, because he loves us, he will scourge every son he receives. Now, look at verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Now he's talking about humans. He's talking about, I mean, any father that loves his child will chasten them. There will be a consequence for wrong behavior to train them into the way that is right. But now look at the next verse. Verse 8. But if you, now he's going back from human fathers to spiritual relationship with God. Verse 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all, this is one of those universal verses, every believer gets chastened, this verse says. If you don't get chastened, then you are illegitimate and are not a child of God. That's a very sobering passage of Scripture, especially for the 21st century church that, that is so conformed to the world. You know, as James McDonald, um, the famous pastor from Chicago said, he says, the seeker movement has sown tares in all churches. Very insightful. And, and what's happening is that it's hard for believers to know who's a believer because everybody is, is being compressed I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about if you look at the church, the modern church, the, the, the visible church, it's just like you can't tell who's the wheat, who's the tares. But the Lord can tell, and look what he does in verse 8. He chastens everyone that's really his. And so that's why he can go right down the line in the church, and there's one person that is being chastened for their sin, and the next one has not a care in the world. And I've told you the story, and I'll just lightly repeat it, because this issue flamed to national prominence in the late 70s and early 80s, when a, a Bible teacher was speaking at a major seminary and a, delivered an address on the content of, of Matthew 7, and the president of that university was taking this teacher back to the airport, and they were talking about his message on the way to the airport, and they went by a Walmart-sized liquor store. And the Bible teacher says, wow, there's a lot of people whose lives are destroyed by that place. And the president of the school said, yeah, one of the elders in our church owns that chain. And the Bible teacher said, an elder at your Bible church owns the liquor barn? And they said, yeah, it's bothered us a little bit, but the fact that he just left his 55-year-old wife for a 25-year-old woman whom he's living with bothers us more. And the Bible teacher said, is he a believer? And the president said, pray to prayer. If you prayed the prayer, you're saved. And that inflamed what is called nationally the lordship controversy because of verses like this. If they remain living with the 25-year-old woman, selling as much alcohol as they can sell, and living like a lost person, and there's no interdiction, no chastisement, no stopping them in their tracks, 
the writer of Hebrews says you should legitimately question their legitimacy and consider confronting them with, have they possibly never been born again? Because that's what it says. So keep reading. Um, furthermore, we've, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect, verse 9 of Hebrews 12. Shall we not much more readily, now listen to this, be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? There's a heavy duty saying, this is, this is a, a restatement of what Jesus said in Matthew, that they call me Lord, Lord, but they don't do what I tell them to do. If you are in subjection to the Father of spirits, that's another name and title for God, the Father. He's the Father of spirits. He's, he's the God over the spirit world. He is the creator, God, all-powerful. If you submit to him, you'll live. If you don't submit to him, you're probably illegitimate. Keep reading, verse 10. For they indeed for a few days... Do you notice how he bounces back and forth, the writer of Hebrews, between human parents and divine parenting? They indeed, that's, that's your dad, your earthly dad, for a few days chastened us as it seemed best to them. Now we're talking about God, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful at the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been chained, uh, trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. What it's saying is that chastening is to, is to get us, it's almost like, um, you know, when you're driving down the road, they have those rumble strips so that you know, um, they even have one in the middle, so that you know if you're going across, either going off the road, <laughs> or you're going across the middle line because you're sleepy, <laughs> it's the rumble strip, it's to, it's to jar you. And that's what he's saying here. Chastening is to jar us so that, that we can yield the peaceable fruit, uh, verse 11, of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It's, it's chastening is to, to help us realize that God will not be mocked. And, and if we sow the flesh, we'll reap corruption. Therefore, he goes on to verse 14. Pursue peace with all people. The people is italicized. Pursue peace with all. And holiness. Now listen to verse 14 without which no one will see the Lord. Now, I told you last week that what this has done is this concept of right here, what I just said, this is the crux, the heart of the lordship controversy. And what has happened is, and I told you before, those who do not like this verse, they have the, two, they have the first class car going to heaven and coach. And what they say is that right there, follow after holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. This is the same thing as it says in, in, you know, in Matthew 5, blessed are the pure in heart, that they'll see God. Well, the impure in heart won't. They'll be so far away from the throne. They're in the coach section, and they are just not really, I mean, it's like sitting in the nosebleed section of the concert, you know. You don't get as good a seat, but you're still there. Is that what this says? That's not what this says. It says, follow after holiness. If you are not holy, as God who regenerates us makes us, then you won't see God. It's a very sobering verse. It doesn't mean coach, nosebleed section. Looking carefully, now he's going to illustrate it. The writer of Hebrews uses many... The writer of Hebrews is massively drawing on the Old Testament scriptures to illustrate. Remember I told you that the Old Testament is like the picture, the illustrations of New Testament doctrines. And the writer of Hebrews is using Old Testament um, events and, and, and people to illustrate doctrine. This is, he goes into one right now. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. There's so much truth here. Bitterness is like 
crabgrass. It's like, it's like, um, it has, it's like um, cancer that, that goes into other organs. Bitterness starts in one place, but it doesn't stop. It just, it starts spreading out. Beware, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now we get to the point, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Did you know if we didn't have that verse, Esau is presented in the Old Testament kind of like a California athlete, you know, dark, suntan, uh, I mean, all American outdoorsman. And then there's this mamby-pamby, weak, pale mama's boy who likes to cook, you know, and wear clothes with mama in the tent, Jacob. I mean, if you read the Bible, Esau looks like the hero. I mean, he's out hunting, and he's, he's a man's man. He's tough and macho and, and everything else. But you know how God, who looks beyond the exterior, God doesn't look at the outside. God looks at the heart. You know what God says that Esau's problem was? He was a fornicator. He could not stop feeding his lusts of the flesh. That does not come out in Genesis 25 onward, from his birth, Esau's birth. You don't ever see fornication. That, that is just amazingly absent from the story. God says, eh, he's a fornicator and he's profane. He went through the motions and, you know, it acted like he was the son of Jacob and the God of Jacob, but he was profane. He, he just, he wasn't reverently in awe of God in any way. When he met Jacob and, and had that exchange, said, I forgive you, you're great. It, it, it was only because God was preventing him from harming Jacob. He was profane. Um, and, and look what it says. Who for one morsel of food sold his birthright? He didn't think that, that the blessing of God was worth more than a bowl of lentil stew. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit blessing, he was rejected. Now look at this. For he found no place for repentance. And we're going to see when we end this in a few moments that the gospel message that Jesus proclaimed to the apostles and then reinstituted to the apostle Paul, and Paul at the end of his ministry reiterates in Acts 26, always involves repentance. Do you know what the first best-selling modern study Bible says, the Ryrie study Bible? Do you know what it says in there? Repentance, an unbiblical addition to salvation. Unbiblical? Dr. Ryrie? I mean, I could even say he's my friend. I've lectured opposite him, but that's wrong. I mean, that's one error in the Ryrie study Bible, probably the only one. It's not unbiblical, and it's not an addition. It's biblical, and it's the basis for salvation, that repentance and faith should be preached among the Gentiles. It's not even for the Jews, but we'll get to that later. So look what happens. He couldn't repent, though he sought it diligently with tears. Wow. Esau came to the point where he says, no, I can't make it without God's, oh, God, help me, help me. But it was too late. That's another doctrine. The Hebrews talks about that while you hear the Lord's voice, don't harden your heart because there'll be a time when you can't change. You can't repent. And Esau hit that. And then, I mean, I'll finish. This is one of the most, I mean, remember I told you every chapter is my favorite? This, I mean, look at what this says. For you have not come to the mountain that can't be touched, that burned with fire. He's talking about, uh, you know, the whole Ten Commandments scene and, and Mount Sinai. Uh, and the blackness and darkness and tempest, verse 19, the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, and those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them anymore, for they couldn't endure them. He's going back to Exodus 20. But look at verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven. Wow. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Uh, by the way, that word made perfect right there at the end of verse 23 is 
the word Jesus said from the cross when, when in English we, we translate it, it is what? Finished. It's the same word. To the spirits of just men made perfect, to telestai. That, that the price has been paid in full, that their sins are absolutely under the, the justifying death of Christ. And then verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. All that to say, remember, if a person says they're a believer and they're living in sin, God will chase them or else. Or else what? Or else they're illegitimate. And that's what the Bible says. And um, I had a little conversation after morning service with someone and they said, did I hear you correctly? Did you say, you know, did you tell me that I shouldn't eat with one of my relatives that's living in fornication? I said, oh, no, no, you didn't hear me correctly. I didn't say that. And they were just, they glowed and they smiled. They said, oh, great, I thought you did. I said, no, God did. <laughs> and I popped out and showed them. And they looked down and they looked at it again. And he said, it really does say that, doesn't it? And he said, yeah, you don't hear that very often, do you? And he said, no, you don't. It's not popular. Okay, fourth, as a deterrent. Now, this, now we're getting into heavy-duty stuff. Now, uh, someone stopped me at the funeral. Part of what made me get cold yesterday is they talked to me outside in the cold weather, blowing and everything, and they said, why don't you ever teach this on Sunday morning? I said, are you kidding? They'd get upset. I said, why don't you teach it on Sunday morning? When they shoot you, then I can still speak, you know? But, but let me just read this to you. As a deterrent, other believers are not to treat sinning believers as if everything is okay. Do you know what is causing the powerlessness of the 21st century church? Born again, spirit-filled, loving the Lord believers see a brother or sister in Christ that is consciously, actively, aggressively sinning, and they just act like everything's okay. Say, how you doing? Good. Praying for you. See ya. That, that is dangerous, where we, we feel that it's none of our business. If they're really saved, it's our business. They are our relative. Would you, would you have a relative that had this cancerous growth just growing out of the side of their head, and they didn't have a mirror at home, they didn't even know it was there, and, and you just said, oh, you look great today, and didn't tell them? That's not love. Sin is worse than cancer. Cancer can only hurt your mortality and your, your physical life. Sin, sin is dangerous. Okay, Matthew 18, 17. Let's just turn to these real quickly, and I want you to read them. We had a, a major discussion about this on staff because uh, I believe it's very important that, that people know um, that God is serious about, if you claim to be a Christian, there are rules you're supposed to operate under, uh, and, and, and there are boundaries in your life. It's not you can do whatever you want, and it's all forgiven. Look what Jesus says. In Matthew 18, 17, the church is to treat an unrepentant believer like they are a heathen and tax collector. What would that mean? Well, let me tell you this. This is what it means from church history. You want to know how the people that heard this right from the horse's mouth, as it were, they heard it right from the apostles. They, they heard it right from those that had known Jesus and walked with him. Do you know what the early church, universally, the early church, I'm talking about the first century, second century church, they did not allow any unsaved person into the celebration of communion. It was a closed service. Communion was so sacred, that worship of the risen Christ who gave his blood as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. No unsaved people were allowed in. In fact, during the persecution, uh, the Neroni and, and onward, all the way through, people were not allowed to come to communion until they'd been a Christian for a long enough time they could tell they weren't going to quit. Because when the Roman soldiers came looking for Christians, people a lot of times said, I'm not one, I deny it, I, I'll, I'll worship the emperor, don't kill me. And those were called lapses. There's the, the whole lapsarian, you know, this, this, these people that lapsed from the, the faith. And then they were brought back into the church. And so what they did is they said, we're going to watch you for a few months to see whether or not you are really a believer. So the early church 
When they saw unrepentant believers, they said, you're not welcome at communion, at the, at the most sacred worship service of all, where we celebrate the one. How often did they celebrate it in Acts 2? They went from house to house, daily breaking bread, and they said, you're not welcome. So that's Matthew 18, 17. Look what it says. And if he refuses to hear them, by the way, this is the, the fourth step. Church discipline is basically this way. If, if you see a friend of yours in Christ doing something wrong, you go to them and say, you shouldn't do that. Or if they sin against you, you say, I, I admonish you, I confront you, I rebuke you, you shouldn't do that. And if they go, oh, I'm sorry, I repent of that, you're supposed to forgive them up to 70 times 7. I mean, if, if, if they keep doing it all day long and they keep saying, I'm sorry, you just keep forgiving them. But if they say, no, I don't care, I'm going to keep doing it. Then, look, look what it says, verse 15 is, you go tell him alone, and, and if he hears you, you've gained your brother. But verse 16, if he won't hear you, if he says, bug off, you know, take with you two or three more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Now, you go and confront them about their sin, that they're, you know, lying or cheating or stealing or, or you know, unreconcilable or embittered or living in sin or adultery or fornication or something, and something happens between verse 16 and 17 a lot of people don't realize what you do is after this group goes and and preferably an elder be involved so that they can confirm that for the church if that person persists in pursuing an unbiblical divorce let's say and there's no biblical reason for them to divorce their believing husband or wife and they just are plowing along and you hear about it and you go to them and you say don't do that and they say bug off leave me alone it's my own life you have no idea and i'm just going to do it then what you're supposed to do is look at verse 17 and if he refuses to hear the church if he refuses to hear them tell it to the church and if he refuses even to hear the church do you know what the the biggest step of church discipline is you announce to the church that so-and-so is pursuing an unbiblical divorce if you know him and love him you ought to talk to him you ought to say you know what you shouldn't be doing that that disobeys the word of God, that dishonors the Lord, that displeases him. It, you're going to have, you think divorce solves your problem? It multiplies them. It's kind of like smashing a light bulb. You're going to step on broken glass the rest of your life. Don't do it. And if they refuse to hear them, look what it says. This is the putting out of the church. We call this in church history excommunication, excommunion tabling. You're not a communicant. You can't come to the Lord's table. You're, you're, refused. You are not allowed. You are kept out. You are not welcomed. Excommunication. Look what it says in verse 17. If he refuses even to hear the church who goes after him, who prays, who lovingly says don't or her, whoever it is, say repent. And if they refuse, let them be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. What is that? They're unwelcomed at communion and, and at the worship of God. So that's Matthew 18, 17. Look at Romans 16, 17. Um, this is very, very much in the fabric of the church. This is why the early church was empowered to do such great things, because they were serious about sin. They hated it. And look at, at chapter 16, the last chapter of Romans, verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, avoid them. Avoid Christians? Yeah. If they're divisive, if they're people, they're always divide. They're always saying, "Did you hear this? Did you know that? You know, have you heard this?" Yeah, I don't like. I'm just. They're just. They're kind of like bearers of gossip, basically, because they have no idea of the context. But they are divisive. Uh, in fact, it's 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 very interesting. Um, the word heresies, hiereo, means to lift up, and there's some people. That, I mean, doctrine is doctrine, but some people, they have their pet doctrine, and they hold it up, and they divide with everyone over that one. I mean, they are not holding every doctrine up. They just leave them all laying there, but boy, are they onto this one, and they just harp on that. That's what heresy is. It's to lift something too high, as in, I told you, uh, the, the universalists take the sovereignty of Christ's sovereign power and his love, and, and, and they say that if such a loving, powerful God could die on the cross, certainly he will not allow anybody to go to hell. That, that's the Calvinistic roots of universalism. 
that sprang out in Prague in, in the 16th century because of elevating one doctrine disproportionately out of congruence with all the others. Well, anybody that's doing that of any kind, note those who cause divisions, verse 17, and offenses, contrary to the doctrine you've learned, and avoid them. You separate from the divisive. For those who are such don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So if they're living contrary to doctrine and dividing uh, people and cause sowing division, avoid them. Avoid them. Kind of like, you remember in football, you learned to keep that stiff arm and you didn't, you, you didn't let them deter you. Avoid them. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 5. I mean, this is certainly not the normal pathway we go in church, is it? I mean, but this is what was, was underneath. This is part of the operating system, the, kind of like the, the cleansing system of the early church. And so Paul, this is the classic chapter, 1 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> it is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you in the church. Such sexual immorality, verse 1, is not even named among Gentiles that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up. You notice that puffed up, it's, it's back in chapter 4, verse 19, it's back in chapter 4, verse 18, it's back in chapter 4, verse 6. This puffed up thing was that they were just heady with their spirituality and with their knowledge and everything else. And he says, and you're puffed up, and you should rather have mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Um, the illustration I use with the staff is, and, and I think I've told you this before, and it, it's a terrible illustration, but when Bonnie and I were newlyweds, we were so poor that I, who paid the bills, didn't want to ever use a diaper that wasn't really used because diapers cost too much. And so when we would detect a diaper need to be changed, Bonnie would say, could you go help me change so-and-so? I said, well, just a minute. And I would, you know, pull the back of the diaper to check and make sure it was really used, you know? And sometimes it was overused, and my checking finger <laughs> was defiled <laughs> by, by the usage. And so that is exactly the picture of a Christian who's living in sin. They have defiled themselves. And what are we supposed to do? Cut the finger off? That's what a lot of people think church discipline is just, cut them off! Or others say, no, let them serve the food at the church supper with that on them, and they'll just defile everybody. See, we, both are wrong. What you do is you hold, you hold the defiled part away from you. you. You keep it so it doesn't bother anything else and isolate it until it can be cleansed. That's the whole process that you see right here of church discipline. What he has done might be taken away from among you, for indeed I'm absent body, verse 3, and I've ju already judged uh, as if I was present with him. Here's what you're supposed to do in verse 4, and this is the whole church discipline, Matthew 18. Th this, you see a narrative of how it runs. I mean, it was a big case. I mean, it was a bad case, but it's a clear pathway. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is verse 4, when you are gathered together along with my spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when they got out of the communion table, I'm talking about, you know, the table that's usually do this in remembrance of me, when they got away from being a part of the body of Christ, celebrating the, the memorial of what he did, there was an element of their protection from the evil one. See, that's what it's saying here, that, that they are open to the destroying power of the devil because God makes them a target because of their sin and allows Satan access to, look what it says, for the destruction of their flesh. In other words, their, their bodies, their, their physical part, that their spirit, the non-material part, may be saved in the day of the Lord. But your glory is not good, verse 6. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You allow that person to own the liquor barn, to leave their wife of 30 years, and to move in and live with a 25-year-old and just say, well, you know, don't know why he's doing that. 
and you let him merrily go along. Look what it does. It leavens the whole lump. What are we supposed to do? Verse 7, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are tr- truly our unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, keep the feast. He's talking about now communion and, and keep the feast, not with old leaven. That's why we're supposed to always examine our hearts and not partake of the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 onward, in an unworthy way. Don't partake with the old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, here's the kicker. Look at verse 9. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since you would need to go out of the world. And here's the verse I showed in the lobby to this lady. said, you didn't say what I thought you said. And I said, no, I didn't say it. Verse 11. Now I've written to you, not to keep company with anyone named a brother, a.k.a. someone who claims to be a Christian, a brother, sister, brother or sister in Christ, born-again person, claims to be saved. Don't keep company with someone who says they're a Christian, who is living with their girlfriend in the dorm, living with this woman because it's too expensive to pay taxes, as a married couple, so they keep their single status. But they, they you know, love each other and they're, they're loyal to each other, you know. Or whatever form of, of sexual immorality they're involved in, you know, they're, they're in a monogamous homosexual relationship. You know, what? What are you saying? No, God defines morality. If they are sexually immoral, don't keep company with them. Or a covetous person, they live for money. Or an idolater, someone who's elevated something in their life above God or equal with God. Or a reviler, someone who just is always, you know, uh, speaking against the things of God. Or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. Now look at the end of verse 11. No, not even to eat with such a person. Wow. Wow. So it says in 1 Corinthians 11, deliver them to Satan, purge out the old leaven, don't company with them, and don't even eat with them. And then 2 Thessalonians 3, you can read it yourself. It says, do all this, but admonish them as a brother. You go to them and say, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, you should repent. And I love you so much, I'm not going to even eat a meal with you, because Jesus told me not to. But I am admonishing you as a brother, to repent of that sin. And the instant you do, I'll rejoice with you. But until you do, I'm going to avoid you. Did you know that's how the New Testament church had purity, had zeal, had boldness, and had the Spirit's power flowing through them. And the world says, oh, how they love one another. And they're doing this? Yeah. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens.